Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and once again it is time for the Monday Q&As. So let's knock this out. First question. How accurate are the calories burned calculators on cardio equipment? Might ask me for my weight and age, does that make it more accurate? You know, in all honesty guys, they aren't very accurate. Yes, things like your age and weight can affect it, but that starts going out the window when you start training heavy because part of the assumption with when it starts plugging age in is that you have less muscle and more fat for your body weight as you get older as you lose muscle. Well, people who are lifting lots of weights might have a lot more muscle at 40 than they had at 20. So it starts to skew those equations. And the other thing is, so what if you accurately measure your calories for eight hours of your activity out of your day? You still don't have your exact count for the other 16. That is the biggest issue we run into with calorie counting. Not is not that calories in and out doesn't work. It's that it is very difficult for us to accurately measure all the variables around our daily caloric burn because just the calories you burn doing your cardio may not account for your full activity. That's why it's best to just keep your activity somewhat consistent. Assess your weight changes from week to week to determine how far off your calories are at the end of the day because ultimately your schedule throughout the week will change throughout the week. Your amount of calories you're going to burn day to day even in your non-exercise activities is going to vary. And yes, even these calorie calculators on the cardio equipment do not always accurately take into account your individual thyroid and other hormones that affect metabolism or the amount of muscle mass that you have. They're not always accurate enough on that stuff to really get you that close on the calories. A good one might get you within 20%, which is pretty reasonable. So at the end of the day, you're never going to pin down with the current technology that we have, the amount of calories you burn in the day just deal with it. Just try to get close and move on with your life. All right, next question. Is doing a high volume, high frequency program for a period of time, such as Smolov or Bulgarian style training, going to hinder progress in the future when switching back to a program with more modest volume and frequency? It's not going to hinder progress so much as that you might just get used to the type of progress you make when you're doing these really high frequency programs. You simply make better progress most of the time on higher frequency as long as you're adapting and recovering and when you cut frequency back your gains will slow a little bit. It's not going to hinder you directly. I mean the amount of workload and stimulation and adaptation that you're stimulating in any given week or month is going to be what it is no matter what you previously did. It's just that when you're used to making faster gains and you've cut through some of your early gains more quickly because the longer we train and the more progress we make, the more diminished the returns get, the longer it takes to make the same amount of progress. So if you've already used a very effective, brutal program like that with high frequency that has gotten you a fair amount of gains, not only are you going to automatically make slower gains because you've progressed to a certain point, but then when you cut the frequency back, you're going to get just slightly less. So it might seem like your progress is just dramatically stalled in, in a lot of ways. But it's not necessarily the fault of the high frequency program in that it has ruined you in any way. So no, I wouldn't worry about that. And there's certainly nothing wrong with going back and forth on this. I mean, Bulgarian type training isn't something you can do all the time. Yes, I've used it in the past, but my schedule as of the last few months has not allowed for me to do it due to my life circumstances. I'll go back to something very similar in the near future, uh, now that I'm getting my Mercedes Benz tomorrow. But as I haven't had a car, for a while and I've had to rely upon other people and I wasn't able to train for several weeks due to my international move, I haven't been able to keep up a program like that. So, you know, people can't always keep up these high frequency programs. Work with the program that you're allowed to work with and realize that any effective program is still going to give you some progress no matter what you've done before. All right, next question. Any negatives to splitting up a workout throughout a day, e.g. squatting morning, bench afternoon, deadlifting in the evening? We could get into debates as far as work capacity versus efficiency and all this all day long. But uh, let's not deal with that because in all honesty, these sort of debates don't really matter other than for the top 1%. People trying to get that half a percent or 1% edge is a serious competitor. The benefits can be that you can get more workload in with heavier weights because you're fresher. So it's a lot easier to come in and deadlift heavy if you squatted 8 hours ago instead of 30 minutes ago. So you're always able to handle heavier weights even doing the same lift throughout the day. There are benefits there. The downside is really is a scheduling and, and what you're doing with your life. Because the truth is, 
not many people's lifestyle who have a real life outside of the gym who are making their living off of their physique or their athletic performance. They aren't serious athletes. Most people don't really have a reason to be training twice a day or three times a day or anything like that who have real lives outside of training. So that becomes the issue of if you aren't trying to go for some sort of real record or something as a serious competitor, you're not making your living in some way directly related to your, your athleticism, if you're having to train twice a day, I don't know, maybe you should reconsider your priorities in life. Either you should be pushing to become some sort of champion or you need to step back and assess what you really have going on in your life. Because most people's lives aren't really going to, who have any sort of real life or career or social life, aren't really going to allow for them to be in the gym twice a day every day. So that's the negative of it, is that it can interfere with your life itself. It's just not really advisable for a half a percent edge if you're not in some way making a living off of this. All right, next question. I had to live with people who smoke inside. I get a lot of secondhand smoke. Well, doing lots of cardio helped me cope with this health-wise. I have no choice but to live work here like this. The cardio is not going to help with the main risks of the secondhand smoke. The real risk is going to be the lung cancer and the buildup of tar and other things in your lungs is going to harm you. The cardio can offset some of the other negatives, things just like the, the rest of the cardiovascular system the, and your heart and your arteries and everything else. All the things that can really get messed up from the smoking there, yes, cardio can help offset that quite a bit. But as far as the other things go, no, it's not going to reduce your chance any of getting lung cancer or problems like that. So what you should do if this is a real concern for you, you need to get your priorities straight in life, step back and go, okay, how much effort am I putting into all this cardio versus how much effort am I putting into maybe changing uh, my career path or my financial security enough so that you can move out of that environment? Because maybe you're in an environment with family or someone because you can't really afford to go somewhere else. It's time to reprioritize your life if you, it's really a major health concern for you. And, and it should be. If you're in a household of people with all the secondhand smoke, yeah, it should be a health concern. And if you're not comfortable with it, Again, time to start reassessing your life and reassessing your priorities, uh, if nothing else, is for your health and very much your, your self-esteem on top of that. Because when you're in a situation to where you're having to live with other people like that, that you don't want to because you can't afford to move out, that in and of itself can break down your, your self-esteem and your self-work. So maybe rethink what you're doing. Maybe get a different life plan going. All right, next question. Does glucosamine actually work for cartilage regeneration in the knee or is it all the scam? The answer is we don't actually know. That's the truth of it. There's conflicting data out there. There's some data that suggests there are benefits to the glucosamine. There's other data that seems to not find any real benefits. It really seems to vary. I would say at this point, the data is not conclusive enough that if it's uh, the cost of it is something that you're concerned about in any way, it's, there's not enough there for you to actually do it. However, if it's just a potential measure for you, your budget allows for it and you can afford it and you just want to do it for the extra chance that it might be helping, it doesn't seem to be harmful either other than to your wallet. So you got to weigh that out for yourself financially. But as far as the conclusive data on it, no, the data is not conclusive as to it doing anything for helping with your cartilage and things like that. It, it's one of those areas of it might help. There's some data that suggests that it might, but it's certainly not conclusive. All right, next question. Why do all my lifts consistently go up bar my overhead press? It seems to happen with a lot of people. Could you give us some tips for overhead press strength? Okay, guys, the overhead press is one of those lifts that is very, very hard to increase on because it's using, uh, it relies very heavily on some smaller muscles like your, your side delts and other things. There's a lot of potential weak links in the overhead press in your upper body. Any of those weak links, and they're, again, oftentimes smaller muscles are going to very much limit it. It is, in a lot of ways, a real test of your total upper body strength to do full range of motion overhead pressing. And so yeah, weak links are gonna limit it and you're using a lighter, overall weight than you are your other big barbell lifts so a, if you get 10 percent stronger on the overhead press you're going to add less pounds than you're going to add to your squat bench or deadlift therefore it's going to make a 10 percent increase seem like a smaller total weight increase so it's going to feel like you've improved less 
because of the weak links on it though, the best way you could get stronger the overhead press is to just do more and more overhead pressing and because it tends to be a secondary exercise for most of us because we're doing other pressing and other big movements for our upper body instead of it, it does tend to get deprioritized. So if you really want to get good at the overhead press, you need to make it a higher priority, uh, give more workload and volume to it and maybe scale some other upper body lifts back in order to accommodate that. If it is really something that you want to improve upon and it's important to you. All right, next question. What makes your 5x5 five five program so different from all others like Mad Cow, Strong Lifts, and Reg Park? And do you believe yours is any more effective because of the difference? I think for the novice lifter, mine is superior. And it's not an ego thing of me saying, oh, just because it's my program, it's better. I looked at all of those programs when I wrote this. When I sat down and said, okay, let me write this program. I said, well, let me look at these different 5x5 five five protocols assess their strengths and weaknesses, uh, use some modern programming, and try to find a system for the first year lifter that will incorporate the best elements of all of these. They're all good programs. Those are all good programs. I recommend all of them, they're all good. But what I did with mine, I said, okay, I wanna make a more balanced version of all of this. Can we get one that's going to keep people assured of progression, keep them in the right intensity range to where they can continue to progress can I address the weak points that often occur because people oftentimes develop some muscle imbalances because not all of those programs are perfectly balanced and everyone's going to get muscle imbalances off of any programs. There's no program is perfect for everyone. Some person is going to get muscle imbalances on it uh, because nothing can be cookie cutter that works perfect for everyone. But what I did, I stepped back and said, can I address the more common, the most common muscle imbalances that can tend to develop on these and can we address them with the accessory work? And that's really what I tried to do. And it's not to say my, my program is perfect, but it is really good. Thousands of people have made amazing progress on it and a few people don't, but hey, that just is what it is. But what I did with it, I tried to address the weaknesses that exist in these other programs for the novice and fix them that the best that I could while still keeping it as a cookie cutter and generic routine. And so that's why I recommend it when I feel it's good. That was my actual goal when I wrote the program. And I only had 25 subscribers when I wrote it, by the way. So it's not like I thought it was ever gonna get as big as it did. It just happened to do so. All right, next question. I'm currently on a cut and my seat quality is terrible. I have trouble falling asleep and wake up way earlier than I should and normally would. Do you know why this is? My dietary fat intake is 80 grams. Well, it's not your fat intake related. I think it's very much a case of what some people don't always realize is that melatonin has a, a correlation with insulin response and blood sugar to some extent. And because you're eating a decent amount of fat, 80 grams, most people tend to, if they're smart, when they go on a cut, increase their protein a little bit. Your fat is in the nice, decent range. So if you've increased protein and you've cut calories, your carbs have come way down. The lower carbohydrates may be causing you to produce less melatonin at night. And accordingly, that might be disrupting your sleep pattern a little bit. It's a factor to consider. The other big factor to consider is, are you using any fat burners, any stimulants? If it's anything from ephedra, ephedrine, clembuterol, if you're using any of these stimulant type fat burners, that alone can interfere with your sleep, or it could be a combination of the two factors. So that's what I would look at. All right, guys, so that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it has been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time in part two.